Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome everybody to the CPHR seminar um, for April 25th. I'm excited to welcome uh, Dr. Teddy Drevis today. He's an internal medicine doctor and a PhD for, at the University of Pennsylvania, where um, he does a lot of work in adult medicine, adult genetics. And um, I met him just recently at ACMG and very quickly learned about how much of an advocate he is for adult genetics. Um, which is something that even though I'm a pediatrician, I feel pretty strongly about as I think it's one of the main ways we're gonna make headway into um, improving care for everybody. Um, and so Teddy is gonna come up tonight and talk about some of the universal exome sequencing that they've been doing at UPenn and a few other things. So welcome, Teddy, thank you. Also, sorry, before we get started, I just want to mention, if you're online and you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A online, and we will um, we'll send them through the mic. And please interrupt with questions as we go along. Yeah, I, I will second that. Please interrupt me at any point. Um, as I tell my patients when I see them, I, I tend to talk a lot, and I will continue to talk. So if you interrupt me, it's even better, because then I can talk even more. Um, so thank you for that uh, very nice introduction, and thank you all for inviting me down to talk about some of our work um, looking at the application of broad genetic testing modalities in the adult patient population. Uh, so just to briefly talk about what I will talk about, uh, two slides on background just to kind of orient us. I'm sure most of us know the, the take home point, which is that we don't test adults nearly as frequently as we probably should or as much as we think we should. Um, then I'll talk about a study which we just had a preprint come out on, which I'm calling here retrospective ICU seek. We haven't settled on a title for it, but th this is what the best we got. Um, and uh, that's the bulk of, the, of these results, looking at what happens if you genetic broadly sequence with exome sequencing critically ill adult patients, young adult patients. What are the results? What are the outcomes? What can we learn from it? And then um, and some work that we haven't published yet, this is uh, the MedGen outcome study, um, is looking at how the outpatient adult genetic testing world kind of gives us some information that can put the ICU sequencing data in context and then general conclusions. But I did just want to briefly mention that most of what I do in the lab is actually not related to uh, clinical genetics in um, its very clinical form, but I'm, a, I'm a, a cilium nerd. I love the primary cilium. Our lab studies disorders of the primary cilium and how the cilium is involved in common disease pathogenesis. This is my lab. Um, there's some cilia, they're pretty. Um, but I just wanted to say that because I can't go through a single presentation without showing a picture of a cilium. So you can forget about that now. We can talk about everything else. So um, by way of background, I probably don't need to tell this group that broad genetic testing is now the norm, right? If we look from PubMed, the number of publications that have been published with the phrase exome sequencing in children over the past 15 years, uh, there are now thousands of publications published every year um, that look at exome sequencing in kids. But the same is not true for adults. Like there, if you just look for any publication that mentions the word adult and exome, you get very few publications. And this isn't surprising to us because we know that we really don't understand still the clinical indications for or the yield of uh, genome or exome sequencing in the adult population because we haven't really studied it. Uh, and this is, I think, a glaring hole in our knowledge. Uh, not least of all because adults represent most of the population. And, you know, this is, you know, we just don't know how to apply these technologies um, in this population, which is, you know, all of us here qualify as adults, right? Um, so what do we know about exome sequencing or genome sequencing in adults? So if we look at, there have been a handful of studies that have looked at this. Um, these are just a few that I pulled from the literature. And this is looking at people who have presented to a neurologist or to an adult geneticist because there is a suspicion for a genetic disorder. And what we see, if we kind of meta-analyze across these, that overall, these, all these studies included about 2,000 patients. The yield is about 17%. Um, that's what's in the literature, right? Not great, but still pretty good. I would say 17% is, we don't want to miss that. And that's a lot of Mendelian disease that would otherwise be undiagnosed. But certainly lower, certainly, it is certainly lower than what we see in the pediatric population. This is from a recent meta-analysis across thousands of kids who are sequenced with exome technologies in different studies, where the yield is 40%. That's probably a little bit high from what we normally quote, but so we're a little bit worse than half off in adults, but still a decent number get diagnosed. Uh, but these were selected populations, right? These were patients who had a suspicion for a genetic disease, but we also know that in the past three or four years, there's been a lot of movement and the pediatric side and the neonatal side at saying, well, maybe instead of just sequencing people based on a high suspicion for genetic disease based on symptoms, we'll do it based on a high suspicion for genetic disease based on critical illness. 
And there have been a number of studies now that have looked at universal, essentially universal exomer genome sequencing in ICU-admitted pediatric patients. And what they found is that the overall hit rate in these patients, where we're not, we're just saying if you're in the ICU, that is enough of an indication for exome sequencing or genome sequencing, it's 32%. So it's almost as high as in the patient population where we're selecting for a suspicion because of a constellation of symptoms. This is just taking all comers. But we have no idea how this might apply in the adult population, right? Like, is critical illness also an indicator of the presence of Mendelian disease in adults? Um, we have no data points to suggest this may or may not be the case. And would it actually change management? Like, there are a lot of questions that I have as an adult trained physician um, when thinking about these problems. So that brings us to the study that we did. Uh, so to kind of go over what it is, how we designed it, um, this study was based off of a resource that we have at Penn called the Penn Medicine Biobank. Um, this is a medical biobank of University of Pennsylvania health system patients. Um, our, our health system is located in Philadelphia, so we can see this is a heat map of where our patients come from, so it's mostly Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, we have more than 250,000 people enrolled, and so far we've sequenced almost 44,000 with exome sequencing and soon to be 60,000. Uh, and importantly, this genetic information is linked to the patient's complete de-identified can be re-identified, but complete medical record. All lab values, tests, imaging results, doctor's notes, everything that's ever been associated with their care is linked to their exome. And another important part about the Penn Medicine Biobank is that it isn't monolithically white. So about 70% of patients in the biobank self-identify as white, whereas 22% self-identify as black or African American. So as far as academic biobanks go, it actually has a relatively large number of non-white patients, which is important for some of the findings that we have in the study. So, so what did we do? I'm going to start by stressing, we did not do this prospectively. We had data and we went and looked retrospectively to see what would happen if we had had to, to, if we had had exome data at the time of ICU diagnosis or ICU admission, um, what would the diagnostic rate have looked like? So what we started with these 43,000 people with exomes. We whittled this down to the about 10% that had ever had an ICU admission at Penn. We took their first ICU admission, they had multiple. And then within that, we took only the, those people between the age of 18 and 40. And when we filtered all this down, we got down to 365 people. So this is the cohort that we, that we went forward with. So the yes? Why 40? Uh, we, so the question was, why did we choose 40? Um, we chose the age of 40 as a cutoff because I didn't want to do 4,000 chart reviews. And I'll show you, uh, the, the older the patients get, the more, the more we get. I have on, the net, on the demographic side, you'll see we have, between the age of 18 and 23, we had some patients. Between 23 and, and you know, 28, it was more. And so as patients get older, there's a higher likelihood they'll be admitted. We started here. We actually started at 35. And then as we were getting interesting results, we said, well, let's go up to 40 and see what happens. And so I would love to do this further in the future. Um, but this is where we had that cutoff for now. Um, so from, from these patients, these 365 patients, we took our VCFs, we did standard quality control like we would for um, a VCF for an exome that we would identify clinically. Um, we also culled from the medical record any ICD code that had ever been associated with a patient record, mapped these to, human, to HPO terms, and then fed these through a quasi-clinical pipeline to generate two reports, one of uh, copy number variants and another, like an exomizer base um, indel and single nucleotide variant report that were then reviewed by myself and another internal medicine, a medical genetics trained provider who had access to the electronic health record. We then swapped charts and checked, and, you know, and we both reviewed each patient, um, each of us reviewed each patient to see if, we had, if there were any variants that had, you know, might have been identified here that could have been diagnostic of a patient's, um, of a patient's ICU admission. So this is the general structure. Let me say, any other questions about that? It's a little bit of a, it's not a complicated design, but just to be clear how it's, yeah. Sorry, of course. Yeah. So the question was, how much of a medical record did a patient have to have to be included in the study? Um, the answer is we took anybody, but these are all patients with ICU admissions. So they did have detailed, at least inpatient um, records. Maybe not passed. Maybe not passed, but overall the average number, um, 90, we're going to butcher this, 96, 97 percent of all PEMID biobank participants have at least eight encounters in the outpatient setting. Um, patients tend to continue to get care here. So although we're a specialty center, they will come and they'll see specialty providers, they'll come back for return visits, they'll be referred to other subspecialty providers, or they'll have outpatient primary care vet doctor's visits. So um, it's, it's not like a one and done type of biobank for the most part. So we do have longitudinal data for, many, for most patients. Um, so what did, we, what did we find in terms of our study participants? So as I was mentioning, first by age breakdown, as the colors get darker here, the patients are getting older. So the, the higher your cutoff of, of age, the more patients you have. And if we extend this up to 
you know, to 65, like we start to get obviously thousands more patients. So we started at 40. Um, we were fairly evenly split between male and female patients. And just as we saw in the PenMed Biobank overall cohort, our population, we saw about 60% white patients in our cohort, 27 28% black patients, 6% Latino, and 3% other 2.2% agents. So a relatively diverse cohort. Um, in terms of the, demo, the reasons that patients were admitted to the ICU, we saw that the vast majority were admitted for cardiac concerns, cancer-related diagnoses, or vascular etiologies, with neurologic coming in second. But those top three made up more than 50%. Um, and thankfully, the mortality rate overall is relatively low. If you look at the, this is not the in-hospital mortality rate for this admission, because overall, 92% um, of patients are still alive to this day. Um, so about 8% have passed away either during that admission or sometime subsequent to it, but most of them are still alive. Yep. any ICU or are there separate ICUs at this hospital, for example, that might, I, I'm surprised there aren't more trauma patients, for example, car wreck. So, so Penn is not a trauma center. Um, and we did specific, I, I didn't mention, we did remove trauma, anyone who had an ICD code as the admission related code that was trauma related, that was only 300 people out of the uh, 4,000 that were um, that were ICU admitted, so it was a very small number. A few snuck by. There were two trauma patients that we, you know, that even with that filtering, like we did when we actually reviewed the charts, we're like, yeah, this is actually a trauma related. Um, most of these patients are being admitted for for like underlying medical conditions. Um, most, many of them very severe, and uh, and you can see like you know things that we often think about, you know, on, in older patients like infectious etiologies. It was only a small percent here, like only seven percent. Um, these were more things that, if you ask me as a geneticist, I would say. Someone under the age of 40 who's being admitted to an ICU for a vascular-related disease, maybe that's actually genetic. Um, and so this, this was the population that we had. Yeah, it's, it's probably more reflective of the age range that we're, used, that we're looking at rather than like, you know, anything specific beyond that. Um, all right, so what did we find? So first, I'm just going to walk you through uh, some of our results. So, of the 300, uh, things, this is what I was hoping to avoid with the, the shifting of text. So of the 365 participants, um, 146 people had at least one suspicious variant. And we had a very high threshold for what we considered suspicious, meaning that we would then go back and actually review it in depth. So of those 146 people, there were 166 variants um, among those people. And these were, and these were uh, mostly for dominant disorders. Here, I'll, stop, I'll stop talking for a second. <laughs> For people online, we're having some feedback in the room. If I continue talking, is it all right now? Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So 365 people, like I mentioned, 146 had at least one variant. Um, among those 146 people, there are 166 variants, so now we're going to individual variants. Most of them were in disorders causative of dominant disease, and uh, there should be bars connecting these, I apologize. Um, but, uh, and most of these had already been annotated in ClinVar unambiguously as pathogenic or likely pathogenic, but there are a number that either were absent from ClinVar, or the gray bars here, or which had been annotated as VUSs. So for anything that was a VUS or absent from, from um, ClinVar, we performed our own variant annotation um, and we're able to resolve these, either they remain VUSs or became VUSs, they weren't annotated or became pathogenic, likely pathogenic. Um, and then to go from variant to actually, did we think these were diagnostic, we applied the following criteria. If a patient had a pathogenic variant in a dominant disease that seemed to be partially or completely related to the indication for their ICU admission, we consider that diagnostic. Um, the same was true for recessive conditions where the patient had to have at least one pathogenic variant and a VUS or pathogenic variant in the other disease, and it had to be consistent with their ICU, um, with the phenotype that they were being um, admitted for. If there were pathogenic variants which were discovered, um, but which were not directly related to the patient's ICU admission, this could be a BRCA2 variant in a patient admitted with cardiomyopathy, for instance, we consider that incidental. And then any VUS alone, we just didn't, we just kept as VUS. We didn't want to read more into it. So we only classified diagnostic variants if they were pathogenic or likely path. Anything that was a VUS stayed VUS. Um, but so what is, so these are the variants. What does this mean overall for the patient population? So what we found was that 25% of patients had a pathogenic variant, a diagnostic variant that was related to their ICU admission. An additional 11% had a VUS, which was suspicious, but was a VUS, so we classified it separately. And about 4% had an incidental variant discovered. 
Um, importantly, this did not change at all across the age range that we studied. So there is no significant correlation between a patient's age and the chance that we found a pathogenic variant in one of these genes. Um, this was, I think, one of, for me, the most surprising. I think that if we went out past 40, um, I think this would probably start to decline, and I can show you some data from the outpatient setting which would suggest this, but at least in this age range of 18 to 40, patients are very likely to, across the age span, to have a, a, a diagnostic result. Um, there were certain indication groups that were more likely to have a genetic diagnosis. So patients presenting for pulmonary-related disease actually had the highest amount. Now, many of these patients were cystic fibrosis patients. Many of them were diagnosed already, and I'll get into that in the next slide. Um, but then the next most common ones were patients presenting with vascular disease, renal disease, gastrointestinal disease. And I had mentioned before that we had some trauma patients that snuck through, two organ donor patients who were present because they're organ donors, no diagnostic results in them, but a few incidental findings. Um, and uh, for infectious and endocrine disorders, we had like the, some of the lower rates of, of uh, diagnostic results. Um, so not, uh, maybe not unexpected. Um, when we look at the actual genes themselves that we discovered, we found that both for diagnostic results and for VUSs, mirroring the indications for which patients were admitted, about 50% of them were in genes that had known effects on cardiac cancer or vascular phenotypes. And to put the whole list of genes that we discovered up here, because people like to look for their favorite genes, like I do whenever you go to a talk, um, these are all the genes that we, that we found. The ones in red are ones that occurred more than once. Um, so there are a few repeat offenders, but if we look at this in other way, more than about half of the genes that we found appeared only once in our data set, and the other half uh, did occur at least two or more times, with some occurring multiple times. The most common being FBN1, causative of Marfan syndrome, where we had eight Marfan syndrome patients um, that were diagnosed this way. CFTR was next with seven. Titan, uh, causative of cardiomyopathy, was next, and then BRCA1, or two rather, VHL, et cetera. Um, so there was some stereotyped the, 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 indi the genes that we found were stereotyped to a certain degree, but half of them were one-offs, which is important, I think, to, to note. Um, so I had mentioned just two slides ago that many of, these, many of these patients appeared to know about their diagnosis. So we wanted to dig into that a little bit more. How many of these were, like, were known? How many were, were not known to patients? It was, almost, it was about 50-50. 47% 40, uh, of patients were not aware, it wasn't documented in their chart, their teams weren't aware, the patients weren't aware of a diagnosis either clinically or molecularly at the time of their ICU admission, whereas 53% of patients were aware. So of that 25% of patients, the diagnostic result, about half of them, it was known, um, but the other half was not. But this was actually dramatically different when we divided this by patient self-reported race. So for white patients or patients uh, reporting an other ethnicity or, or ancestry, um, the majority of patients, their diagnosis was documented in their chart. But for black or Hispanic patients, it was significantly lower, with three quarters of patients being unaware of their diagnosis. Um, and this is maybe not surprising, but it's important when we consider that there were differences in mortality based on whether a patient knew about their diagnosis or not. Now, I mentioned earlier, thankfully, the mortality rate was relatively low, so these didn't reach statistical significance, but there were pretty strong trends that a patient with a diagnosis that was documented in their chart, the mortality rate was about 6%. For patients with negative exomes, um, it was about 8.5%. And for patients with diagnoses that were there in the exome but weren't documented in their chart, it was about 10%, so you know, almost twice as high as in the patients with a known diagnostic group. Um, so there are implications for this that are, you know, that these race-based disparities are, are potentially leading to directly to changes in mortality that are, you know, that are um, worsening healthcare disparities. Yeah. How much does CFTR and the BRCAs play into that racial disparity? Because you would think CFTR is mostly going to be European mm -hmm. and BRCA likely also a lot of those are going to be European. That's a great point. We didn't, um, I didn't break this down by gene. I think I have a slide further down, I do, breaking it down by indication group, which might get at that a little bit. Um, I could think, I, I'm not sure if I have a good way to, 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 to answer that right now, but that's a good point, um, that this could be just because of diagnoses that are known or more common in one ancestry group. However, that being said, I still think that, you know, you can make the case that, you know, if there were undiagnosed sickle cell patients, I mean, that you could always make the, you know, the patients who, if their mortality rate was higher if the diagnosis wasn't known, whether or not it's more common in one group, it might affect the statistics, but I think it might still suggest that, like, there is an underdiagnosis in a group based on, you know, based on their racial background, um, something that we, we, could, we could fix if we employed a broader testing approach like this, where we're not relying on people to refer patients and, refer, and referring patients maybe differentially based on their race. Um, but that's an excellent point. 
Um, so another thing that we looked at then was length of stay. And there were some differences in length of stay between these three different diagnostic groups. So just looking at the mean length of stay, um, interestingly, we, I don't know exactly how to interpret this, but patients with a known diagnosis are actually were significantly more likely to, to, have, to have longer ICU stays um, than patients with a negative exome or patients with, um, an, a, with a diagnosis that wasn't known to them. Um, and looking at this another way as a survival curve, we can see that the chance of staying in the ICU is, high, is higher over, to, um, over day of hospitalization for patients in the known diagnostic group than other groups. Uh, this might suggest that, that, you know, that maybe care teams are treating patients more, more cautiously if they have a known genetic diagnosis and that the patients without a known genetic diagnosis are, um, are getting I want maybe perhaps different care. They're being treated differently because they're not thought to be as brittle, perhaps. Yeah. It, it could well be that the reason that diagnosed patients are diagnosed is that they're sicker. I mean, they have you know more manifestations of disease, and that's what's leading to their increased intensity yeah. of care, right? Absolutely, but they also are less likely to die. Um, and so, it's, but it's, so it's hard to. I agree. It's hard to tease it apart. Um, and uh, as I said at the beginning, and I'll say three times over, because this was a retrospective study, we don't really have a way to know like is making a like uh, all the uh, NICU sequencing studies they often randomize patients to genome sequencing with results tomorrow or results in six months. Um, and that allows you to then actually say, like, does it make a difference? Like, if we found these diagnoses and diagnose people, does their management change? Um, that's really what's needed to answer these questions. Otherwise, we're just looking at associations, which, yeah, I think that, I think either of those interpretations is valid. Right? That's a great point. All right, so I wanted to focus on two cases now because I think numbers and statistics are, are great, but I think that you know, many of us are, are clinicians and like looking at two cases can put these things in context. So uh, this first case, this is it was a 19-year-old black woman who um, presented with severe preeclampsia at 36 weeks. Um, she presented for a C-section because of concerning fetal heart tracings and everything went well. She was discharged in good health, the baby was healthy. Um, and she came back to the clinic, let's see if this will work. There's a video that's supposed to pop up, and last time I went too far with it. Let's, there you go. It's probably not going to play. Um, but she presented three weeks later in cardiogenic shock. And if this video would play, you would see that her left ventricular ejection fracture, was, was her left ventricle was barely moving. Um, I wonder if there's a way that I can actually stop the, uh, the video from playing, because otherwise it's, I'll just click all the way through. Maybe that'll do something for me. Well, I'll talk while I click. Um, in the emergency department, she suffered a, a PEA arrest and was crashed to ECMO, um, which she remained on ECMO for two weeks, but did make a meaningful recovery over two months. Um, her left ventricular ejection fraction recovered to 40%, and she was discharged with follow-up. But then about six years later, she came back with her second pregnancy, again, an uncomplicated plan C-section, went home, did well, but three months later came back with nausea and vomiting and was found to be in an SV, uh, have a supraventricular tachycardia, again, had a PEA arrest in the emergency department, crashed to ECMO and this time didn't do as well, wasn't as lucky and deteriorated, went into multiple organ failure and because of this was not deemed a transplant candidate um, and ultimately passed away in the ICU, leaving behind two kids. And at no point in this course was genetic testing offered to this patient. And if this will advance, you'll see that we actually found a Titan pathog likely pathogenic variant, a known likely path variant that's been documented in ClinVar in this woman, which is super consistent with her presentation. Like this is a very classic Titan presentation. Um, and it's something that, you know, that, that could have been found. Now, would it have changed her management? That's questionable. Like, you know, like there's not a specific medication or thing we do differently. She definitely would have been counseled very aggressively about the risks of pregnancy, especially after a, a postpartum cardiomyopathy with her first pregnancy. So you can make the case that there could be a difference, but um, this is someone who probably should have been diagnosed and, and was not. And yeah. The first time it got up to 40%, the second time, she was on ECMO until she passed away. So it didn't recover completely, but it did recover enough that she was able to go home. Yeah? Um, do you know what year the first and second um, admissions were in? I can probably figure that out if I think I've, I've looked at this case a number of times. Uh, it's okay if not. I yeah, just was curious it, from the like where we were. It probably would have been, uh, the first one probably would have been about 2019. Yeah, these are relatively recent, almost all of these patients, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it wasn't like 50 years ago. <laughs> um, is there another question? No. So case two, this is a 32-year-old white woman who had been experiencing worsening headaches over six months. Um, she eventually went to a neurologist, ordered an MRI, MRA that showed an unruptured left ICA aneurysm. 
uh, here's a picture of, she had an invasive angiogram that confirmed this aneurysm and also showed a right carotid cave aneurysm. Here's a picture of the um, left aneurysm here. Um, she underwent successful pipeline stent placement to the left aneurysm, did well postoperatively, had a repeat angiogram that showed no residual filling, everyone was happy. Um, went home, was doing well, came for just routine follow-up uh, invasive angiogram a few years later. And at this point, they said, well, the left one looks good, but I think we're recommending intervention on the right side now. So she underwent a pipeline stent placement there, also placed successfully, also surgeon happy with results. But in the immediate post-op procedure, developed right wrist pain at the radial access site and was found to have a pseudoaneurysm of the radial artery where they accessed her for her invasive imaging and, and stenting. And this was you know, procedurally thrombosed. Um, and eventually, you know, later went back for a repeat angiogram that showed that everything was you know, in place where it should be in the brain, you know, and everything, you know, everything went well with this minor hiccup of this, uh, you know, pseudoaneurysm, which could have been worse. Um, but she went home and so far is doing okay, still living. And despite having two aneurysms and having a uh, vascular complication at the access site, was never offered testing. And our exome revealed a pathogen, likely path collagen 3A1 variant diagnostic of vascular Euler's Danlos syndrome. This is, again, a very classic presentation for these patients. Um, even just looking at the Gene Reviews article, um, I highlighted here all the invasive angiography procedures she had done. These are relatively contraindicated in these patients because of their vascular fragility. And she did, in fact, have an, an, a, a um, negative outcome from one of these in that she had a pseudo, pseudoaneurysm, which maybe could have been prevented, you know, like if, if she had not been accessed so many times previously for all these uh, diagnostic angiograms. Um, so two cases that I think illustrate a number of the points that uh, testing for these patients is, you know, we're, we're under testing this population and it does seem like there are some disparities in who's getting testing and, and, uh, and, and who should be tested. So overall conclusions, um, I mentioned we do have a preprint out, um, but so 25% of patients have a Mendelian diagnosis. About half of those are known, half are not known. So if we were to just universally test everybody, it would be about 12% of patients who we would discover a new clearly diagnostic variant in. Um, the other 12% or so have known, diagnosis, have known, uh, known diagnoses. Um, this diagnostic rate did not decrease with increasing age, at least up until the age of 40. And we did discover significant disparities, um, race-based disparities, in terms of who had their diagnoses made at the time of their ICU admission, and that these, um, and that having a diagnosis made actually correlates with lower mortality. So there was higher mortality in patients with undocumented diagnoses. Um, I've mentioned a few times there are a number of caveats to these studies, to the study. One is a single center site, or study. Um, Penn is a tertiary care facility, like I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we have a large aortopathy program. Uh, we had eight Marfan syndrome patients. So it could be that these numbers are uh, inflated because we are seeing patients who, who are, our patient population is just in general enriched for patients with, with Mendelian disease. That is certainly a possibility, probably true. Um, so I think replicating this at other sites, uh, not just tertiary hospital centers, but also uh, community hospitals and ICUs would be important. Although that being said, most community ICUs do not have patients under the age of 40 in the ICU. So I think that it's kind of, you know, most patients end up at a higher level of care if they're young and have like a catastrophic event. Um, it was a retrospective study, so we really can't say anything prospectively about how making these diagnoses might change management. Um, I think a minor caveat is that this is, this is all research-based testing, but we do know that for sequencing-based testing, most variants replicate. We had some discussions before about sample swaps, things like that. These are all possibilities for sure. So, um, you know, I think that having this testing certified, a CLIA certified, or having it done on a clinical basis rather than a research basis would remove those, uh, would help address some of those caveats. And of course, this is all dependent on patients' enrollment in the Penn Medicine Biobank. Now, all the metrics that we have from Penn just across the Biobank show that it is a relatively representative sample of the overall patients that are at Penn. But you can imagine that people who consent to enrollment might be people who think that they have a genetic disease or who know they have a genetic disease, so there could be some inflation at numbers there. Um, and so these are all things that we, that we you know, would like to study um, or like to address by doing a prospective study, um, which we're hoping to come up with a way to fund and do in the near future. Um, so that's that first part, and I'll stop if there are any questions about that. I think I have plenty of time, so. Uh. <laughs> so you have to do the 50 and 60-year-olds, and then you probably, I mean, it's flat, right? It, you want to help me do the chart review? Uh, <laughs> well, well, so there, there are electronic ways of yeah. doing some of that, and, mm -hmm. and I bet you could train an algorithm yeah. based on what you did in the, in the younger ones, but if it's flat across the, you expect the 18-year-olds to have a ton of stuff, and, and they didn't, so. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the, um, I will say that the 18 to 23 year old, there were very, very few patients in that category. Sure, sure. So it, the, the numbers could, you know, it yeah, could be that, but on the higher ones, yeah. Whatever. 
I agree. Um, the other thing is, is Vanderbilt has a huge bio bank, bank yeah. and, and you could do the same study with them, and they, they actually could extract the data yeah. electronically and teach you how to do that. Yeah, so yeah. We, one of our collaborators at Penn, um, Anurag Verma, is working on large language model based um, extraction of data from a medical record. Um, I'm working with him on a project looking at Marfan syndrome more generally, not in the ICU, but um, his goal is that we'll be able, for the PEMED biobank patients, we'll be able to have an instance of a large language model that you can ask it a question and say, like, does the, you know, give me a summary of this patient's ICU admission on this date, and it will give you, like, a discharge summary style um, thing. But, yeah, I, that, that would streamline things for sure with the caveats of they hallucinate occasionally, things like that. But, um, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I would love to do more. So it sounds like you have next steps in terms of bigger studies, perspective studies, et cetera, et cetera. But has this changed kind of how you've been practicing or how others have been practicing just in the ICU, just anecdotally so far from what you found? Uh, the answer is no. It hasn't changed anything for anyone. Um, it, it's a relatively new study. Like, we only uh, released uh, the preprint of like a month and a half or so ago. Um, the plans for future studies are we need to apply for funding to be able to do this prospectively and actually do this on a clinical basis. And so that, that's in the works. But um, we have a decent relationship with a lot of our ICU doctors, and I've said to a few people that, but despite our best efforts, like we teach them, we'll, we'll see, we'll, they'll, they'll call us for a patient who is a very obvious genetic patient, like a patient on ECMO, for instance, who is 25 years old and heart failure, and we'll diagnose them with some uh, mitochondrial disorder or some sort of a cardiomyopathy. And then for about a month or two, as we were saying, they will send us a lot of consults and our hit rate will be 80 or 90% because they're only sending us the super advanced ones and we'll send rapid exomes on them, not in a study, but just like as part of routine clinical care. And then either, like Les said, the fellow will rotate off or something like that and then it stops. And then we never, and then we never get consults again. So um, we're hoping that this will go, like uh, when we do submit this for publication, that it will go more to a general medicine audience rather than to a genetic audience. I think that's the audience who needs to hear. I mean, I think everyone, it's important for everybody to hear, but I think that's the audience who really needs to hear it. Um, but yeah, it hasn't really changed much, unfortunately, yet. Yeah. All right, so I guess I have a little bit of stuff for this other study that we're doing. We're calling the MedGen Outcome Study. Um, so this was another retrospective study that we did, not in the inpatient setting, but and not at the Penn, Med Bios and, uh, Penn Medicine Biobank but of all the patients that we ever saw in the general genetics outpatient clinic over a five-year period from 2016 to 2021, which Zoe was part of, um, who's now here. Um, and so just to give a little bit of background on it, so like I said, this is retrospective, all the patients that we ever saw. Um, we, our general genetics clinic sees most genetics in the adult population, except for the like routine cancer diagnosis. So BRCA1 and 2, et cetera, will go to a separate cancer genetics clinic. There's a separate cardiomyopathy genetics clinic that we'll see a decent number of cardiomyopathy patients. We don't get too many. Um, and there's a neurogenetic clinic, which has kind of existed, not existed, existed, not existed over the past few years. So sometimes we don't see the neurogenetics patients, sometimes we do. Um, but altogether, over five years, we saw a little bit more than 5,000. We had more than 5,000 visits for about 4,800 unique patients. And genetic testing was sent for about 43% of these visits. Um, and I just want to show a little bit of the data, but specifically focusing on some of the data on healthcare disparities that I think really mirrors what we saw in the ICU, but in the opposite way that might suggest why we see some of these disparities in the admitted inpatient, critically ill po patient population. So our demographics, this is just a heat map of where our patients come from who come to our clinic, very similar to PEMED Biobank, focused around Philadelphia, extending into Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania. Um, these are supposed to be colored by, uh, by age. The, the bimodal distribution is females, and the more, mono, uh, sing, you know, the more normally distributed one is male patients. Um, but the point here is to make that we see patients up until their 80s. Um, we see patients across the age span. Um, and so it's not, we're not just seeing the young adults in clinic. We really see patients across all ages. Um, so look at, uh, you know, this is a very bird's eye view picture. This is a graph that will maybe come up there. Um, there were over 377 distinct indications that patients were sent to us for. That's what these bars represent here across different phenotype domains. We found 420 different genes that had pathogenic variants or VUSs, just like the, in terms of the genetic architecture. I don't want you to like, focus on this other than to say there's a lot of data here, a lot of diversity in the things that we see in this clinic. Um, and like we saw in the ICU study, the yield of testing, it did decline here, but it didn't decline dramatically. 
So this is the yield of genetic testing with diagnostic results, pathogenic results in blue, um, where it does go down. There's a significant relationship with age, but it stays above 15% even up until patients in their 80s. So there's probably, again, self-selection here. The 80-year-old patient who's coming to see us is probably one where either their kids or some, or they themselves, are like, I, or their physician, really thinks there's a reason for them to get to the geneticist. And so when we do test them, um, we, you know, we find things about 15%. But it, it, doesn't, can, it doesn't go down to zero, right? It kind of drops up until the age of about 40 and then flat and stays, and stays about the same over. And this is, again, all clinical genetic testing. This is not research-based. This is what we see in our clinic, clinically clear, certified in VTA, GNPX, et cetera. Um, there, just like we saw in the ICU sequencing study, there were some indications that were more likely to yield results than others, vascular malformation disorders all the way on the left, um, and things like... Uh, hypermobility and immunologic and hematologic disorders all the way on the right, which are much more likely to yield VUSs than diagnostic results. Um, but importantly, what we found when we looked at what, which patients were being sent to us, uh, we found there were differences based on race. So if we look at the racial population of Philadelphia from the most recent census, we see that it's actually a majority black city. Um, Penn does not, the UPHS health system doesn't specifically represent Pennsyl Philadelphia because we had patients coming from the suburbs and from elsewhere. Um, but for UPHS, for different subspecialty clinics within the UPHS health system, we see that they're all about the same in terms of having about 20 to 25 percent patients that self-identify as black or Hispanic. But patients in the genetics clinic, that's not the case. It's a substantially smaller number of patients that are coming to see us. And we looked at uh, multiple different outpatient clinics. Genetics stands out. There are fewer black and Hispanic patients being sent to see us or that are actually coming, maybe they're being referred, but there's a bottleneck somewhere. They're not actually being evaluated by us. Um, and this is significant. And we actually just started to val replicate some of this in, um, in the Mass Gen Brigham and Women's Biobank. And this is the first bit of data that we got. Harvard is a much whiter health system in general, but the exact same thing is true. We're about, it's about half as many black and Hispanic patients, or half as many black patients are being referred um, or seen in the genetics clinic compared to either of the other subspecialty clinics or to the overall health system. So this does seem to be genetic specific, um, and it's not just specific to Philadelphia. It's also, we see this in the, in the Harvard system. Um, when we looked at socioeconomic status as another indicator, the way that we did this was a little bit roundabout. We don't have information like median household income for every patient that we see, but we can map patients to the census tract that they come from, and we can take the median um, social determinative health index for that, for these different matrices, and we can count on the horizontal axis here how many patients per thousand are we seeing from that census tract, and then on the other, on the vertical axis, we can look at any SDH metric that we're interested in. In this case, this is the percent of the population with an advanced degree, and we can see that here, there's a very strong correlation between the more people with an advanced degree, the more likely we are to see you in the genetics clinic. And we do this across a number of different um, SCH uh, measures. What we find is that there's a positive correlation between being seen in genetics clinic and the percent of your neighborhood that's white, the percent that has an advanced degree, and the median household income. And there is a significant negative correlation with the percent of your neighborhood that is Hispanic, the percent with less than a high school education, the percent on Medicaid, and the percent with limited English speaking. So not surprising, I would say, but like clearly present in the data. Um, and I should also mention that if we, oops. Let me go back. Um, if we do this, if, this is independent of race. If we only do this for the patients who self-identify as white, the exact same trends are there. So this is independent of the race of the patient. So race is an effect, has an effect on the likelihood of being evaluated in the clinic, and so does socioeconomic status. Um, if patients do come into clinic, uh, our next question was, well, what, is, what are the effects of race and socioeconomic status on the outcomes of evaluation? So we looked at three different outcomes. One was, did we send genetic testing or not? Did we get a positive result or did we get a VUS? And for patients who are self-reported black and Hispanic and ancestry or ethnicity, we found that we were actually significantly more likely to send testing up if they came to our clinic. We were not significantly more likely to get a VUS or a positive result. Like those were not significantly different. Um, which uh, the way that, that we have thought about this is that, well, let me, let me finish the slide and we'll come back. When we look at socioeconomic status, we found the socioeconomic status, I guess selected two here, didn't have a strong effect on if we sent testing or not, but on the first graph here, or the middle one, the higher your, household, your median household income was, the less likely you were to get a positive result, more likely you were to get a VUS. And the same with the, advan uh, the percent of the population with an advanced degree. The, higher, the more educated your neighborhood was, the less likely you were to get a positive result. And I think to put this in, in, in context as best I can, I think there is relative overutilization of the genetic testing clinic by more affluent, more educated, 
whiter populations and relative underutilization by black and Hispanic patients and by patients from lower socioeconomic backgrounds such that when we do see um, black and Hispanic patients, for instance, in clinic, we're more likely to send testing on them because the ones who are coming in are probably ones who are more, who are actually being sent in because there's something very obviously genetically different about them. And so we recognize that and we are more likely to send testing. That's one way to interpret these results. Um, but it's just, um, this is, I think, mirrors to a certain degree what we saw in the micu -seek study, but in the opposite direction. Um, we then wanted to know, well, are there particular indications that black and Hispanic patients are more likely to be referred for? And we found that there were. Um, disorders of the eye and ear, renal disorders, cancer-related disorders, and endocrine disorders all were significantly more likely to be seen in patients. Uh, we're more likely to be, black and Hispanic patients were more likely to be referred for those indications, and those that they were less likely to be referred for included hypermobility, lysosomal storage disease, and intellectual disability developmental delay and autism spectrum disorder. Um, and this is where I'm gonna pull back the you seek study. This, I didn't show this graph before, but this is the percent of results that are known in green by indication group. And they really line up very well with the, with the indications that black and Hispanic patients are being referred for. The indications they are more likely, to be, more likely to be referred for are also the ones that are more likely to be diagnosed in our IC, previously diagnosed in our ICU sequencing study. And things like multi-system disorders or you know, intellectual disability related disorders in the bottom, those are the ones that are most likely to be non-diagnosed in our ICU patients. And they're also the ones that are less likely to, we're less likely to have black and Hispanic patients referred for. Um, so this is really me reading into the data for sure here. But I think the fact that these so perfectly line up with each other suggests to me that the reason that we are seeing, a, a, the reason that there are, the black and Hispanic patients are having diagnoses that are going undiagnosed and that are causing critical illness is because they're just not being seen in our clinic, because they're not making it in the door, um, which may have to do with the differences in referral basis, or it may have to do with um, differences in the their ability to, you know, our clinics are Monday through Friday, nine to five, you know, or eight to five, you know, like if there are different, if there are issues with socioeconomic status, like we showed and like needing childcare or whatever it might be, there, there are bottlenecks here, they're not letting them get seen. And that these things are actually then manifesting in them having diagnoses in the inpatient setting that are directly contributing to worse outcomes. Um, and that you know, we could have diagnosed if we had seen them earlier and we're not seeing them. So to put all of this together, um, just three bullet points, there are broad indications for evaluation in the adult genetics clinic, like I showed you, and our yield um, uh, does decrease, but it stays relatively high across the lifespan. We have a significant underrepresentation of black patients and patients of lower socioeconomic status in the genetics clinic, both at Penn and at Harvard. Um, and black and Hispanic patients are more likely to have testing sent if evaluated. Um, and they're more likely to be referred for indications with, I didn't really harp on this point, but with more objective symptomatology, cancer renal disease, eye, like blindness, and less likely to be referred for hypermobility, lysosomal storage disease, intellectual disability, things that it's a little bit, it's hard to ignore a cancer diagnosis. It's, you can, it's easier for a provider to maybe ignore a mild intellectual disability. Um, so there's some patterns that we saw emerging. So putting it all together, the three main graphs. So one, if we sequence everyone in the ICU who's under the age of 40, 25% will have a diagnosis. There are significant disparities between black and Hispanic patients and white patients in terms of who is aware of their diagnosis. And we are also significantly less likely to be seeing black and Hispanic patients in the outpatient setting. All of these things, I think, go together to show that I'll leave with, end with this question, which is, is really the best way to deal with this, not to educate providers, not to just keep on rabble rousing that we need to see more patients, we need to talk to our ICU doctors and say, you need to send more. Maybe we just need to sequence everybody because maybe that's the only way to equitably do this. Um, it might be the faster way to do this, uh, and we'll just you know, broadly sequence and take the, take the positives and counsel them. Um, it might just be the fastest way to combat disparities and to actually improve health outcomes across the board. So I will end with that, and I want to say that for the ICU sequencing study, it was actually a small group that, that was able to go through this data. So myself and Jessica Gold were the physicians who did the chart review. Colleen was um, a data scientist who helped pull some of the data. The MedGen outcome study being very collaborative across different clinical specialties. Um, we had many people to thank for this, including Zoe, who's in the audience here with a picture that I found on LinkedIn. Because um, <laughs> since she ha isn't at Penn anymore. <laughs> but there are many, many people who see these patients at Penn and our, and our collaborators at Harvard as well. Oh, I left Colleen there twice without an extra name. But anyway, thank you all very much. And I'm happy to take any more questions as well. So, thanks. Uh, we can't. 
Thanks, Teddy. So we're going to take questions from here, but people online, if you have questions, please submit them to the Q&A while we're taking ones from in the room. Okay, so um, kind of related to that, should we just sequence everybody? Did you find any other correlates or significant variables that were associated with a positive diagnostic result in the ICU study? Because age was obviously not one of them, so I'm curious kind of how deep of a dive you did to see if it was like severity on presentation or something else that could help explain whether somebody was gonna come back positive aside from just like, did they come in for like a pulmonary or cardiac indication? Yeah, so, um I don't know if, I, if there's a good metric that we could pull in terms of severity on presentation other than some sort of a subjective thing that we, I mean, we could. We could, we could try to come up with a, a metric that we could try to evaluate them by. We looked at length of stay, you know, but that's more of like a downstream effect. We could look at social determinants of health, but something we haven't done, we haven't geocoded the, uh, um, we, well, we do have all pine medicine biobank patients geocoded, so we could look at other social economic status factors that might correlate with it, but we haven't looked beyond that. Um, but I'm all ears for anything that you would like to, I mean, you know, it wasn't age. We didn't look at sex, actually, um, but we were pretty evenly split, split male and female, and then we looked at, at self-reported race, or I should say electronic health record reported race, which is often not self-reported. It's often assigned by a provider looking at a patient, which is problematic. But. <laughs> So there's a, is there a name? Hi, um, Anyang Do, if you're online and you can unmute, you can ask your question. Thank you for sharing your work. Uh, do these data sets lend themselves to secondary slash incidental findings analyses? In implementing broader genome exome sequencing, what will be needed to ensure that the underserved population have appropriate counseling slash supportive follow-up services? Yeah, so um, thank you for asking that. It's a, a, a great question and one that we had a lot of great discussions about earlier today um, with some of the, the folks here. Um, we don't yet have a very robust return of results program at Penn. We are working on it, trying to figure out how to get results back from results from this study back, but also more broadly, secondary findings across the entire biobank. So across 45,000 people, there'll be plenty of people with ACMG secondary findings that we could, and um, that we are planning on returning. Um, the studies that we do have ongoing currently are looking at BRCA1 and 2. Uh, it's being led by our oncology group. and. <laughs> For better or worse, the, the response rate from patients has been very small. Only about 20% of patients who they try to recontact, and this could be because of the way that it's being phrased when they contact patients, but only about 20% um, actually say that they would like, or only 20% actually follow through and don't hang up the phone. Um, I think that we could do things to, to improve that, but I totally agree that when we have this information here, it's research-based data, but for many patients, having an incidental finding, you know, with, with it clear implications for management um, returned would be important. But if we're going to be running, I think that what the question is getting at is, if the answer is, oh, come and see us in genetics, and there are disparities about who is actually able to come and see us, are there better ways that we could do that? Um, I, I, I think we won't know unless we study it. And I would imagine that um, if we can communicate over the phone or over email that this is an important thing for your health, uh, this is something where we, there's something we could do to change it that might entice people more to come in. We've also talked about having clinics on like Saturday clinics and we haven't gotten that together yet. Um, I think as our group continues to grow, as it clearly has, um, it might become more feasible. But th there, those are ways that we're trying to make it more accessible. But the first step would be to return the results. And we still haven't gotten that completely off the ground yet. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so to an extent, maybe I'm guilty of being a little too optimistic and long-sighted, but to an extent, the adult sequencing problem will go away, Yeah. right? Because it seems to me, if it's compelling to sequence an adult, all adults, it's more compelling to sequence all children. Yeah. Right? I, I would agree with you. I think this is a problem that we'll have for about 20 years, and then it should hopefully go away. As you know, 20 years from now, everyone will have already had their genome as part of their medical record, right? That's, that's where you're getting at. Um, but I, I don't think that's a reason not to do this now. Um, and yeah, and, and I still don't think that it necessarily means that the problem will be solved. I think that even if everyone has 
their genome as part of their medical record. Um, things that might have been incidental when they were 18 might become disease, like actually relevant you know, now that they're 30 in the ICU. And having people that are trained and understand how to interpret that and how to actually manage the patient is going to be key. And even just having the care teams knowing that this is something that is actually affecting a patient's care. Again, we weren't able to like look at this because it was a retrospective study, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if just, just having the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome in a chart might, that might not mean that that patient would get different care, you know, or having a diagnosis of a COL3A1 variant in the chart. Would that actually have stopped patients, uh, providers from doing invasive uh, angiography? Like, I, I don't know. And I think the only way to do that would be to study it. So the problem is both sequencing, but then also having the knowledge base to deal with it. And I, I think that problem is going to haunt us for a lot longer than 20 years. Yeah, but if, if having a Marfan diagnosis in your chart doesn't give you different <laughs> care at Penn, then our healthcare system has no. That's a, that, that is a good point. And most of the Marfan, not all, but most of the Marfan patients were diagnosed. So yeah, I think yeah. it was like 70% were diagnosed, but 30% weren't. So it's, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so on the slide that you showed, the difference that the small proportion of genetics, people referred to genetics clinics being black. You also had like the cardiology clinic and somebody else, and, and they all were small. So, so mm -hmm. genetics wasn't that different. There, right. but but they were not. In fact, cardiology and endo were actually. If, so this is there a laser pointer? Yeah, it was the the thing on the right there. Yeah, it does work over here. Um, so this is the overall University of Pennsylvania healthcare system, right. mm -hmm. and then these are clinics that are at the same physical location as our genetics clinic. Um, and so these, if anything, actually have a larger percent of patients that are black. And so we're, we're just but we're just across the board, no matter how you look at it we're worse than everybody else in terms of who's coming to see us. Right, I, on, yeah. the, on the left, on the right. Oh, the right for Harvard, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, there, it's, there's no difference. It's about, I mean, it's about half as many. It's just that there's oh, so okay. few, it's just that there's so few people. I mean, it's, it's there, it's, it's just that there, okay. Boston is a very white city. It is, it is a little smaller. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, P-values can lie because people, there's a lot of data here and so like I've significant P-values in that. But it's about, I forget the exact numbers, but it was like 5% or okay. it was 3% versus 6% or something like that. So it's half as many. Yeah. So, so yeah. it does raise the question, is there something about genetics that, mm -hmm. is, that people are avoiding? Yes. Right. Um, and I guess I wasn't sure in your biobank, in order for them to be in the biobank, do they have to give consent to be in it or is it? So they've already consented to something genetic. So for the biobank they do, this is not biobank data. This is everyone who has ever seen at Penn. This is just looking oh, at the right, data. just for the, coming to the genetics. So it could well be that they're getting turned off by genetics. It could be, it could be that. Um, it could be structural oh. like barriers in terms of just logistics. Yeah. Um, there, there is, you know, literature on mistrust of genetics in oh, particular, sure. right? Um, I do think we overestimate that a little bit, and I think it's more to do with the way that it's presented to, to patients. And I think that if we change the way that we discuss it, most patients are, but you know, are are willing to, you know, are, are interested in learning more. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. It could be something that's not, it's not an us problem. It's you know, a they're, we're not communicating it appropriately to, for patients to know why it's important. You know, they're, they're right, those issues. Right, it's the referrer's problem in, in recognizing this is a potential barrier and right. here's how we address it with confidentiality or right. you know, whatever. Right, right. So. People who aren't turned off by the word genetics are turned off by the word counseling. <laughs> <laughs> right? That, that, that's, that, that's a fair point, yeah. <laughs> um, trivial question on your... Um, ICU study, how did you phase for the recessive disorders? So that, that was, we, we can't phase from, effectively, from the exome sequencing data. Um, so we don't know for a fact that they were, uh, that they were in trans. Um, it was a very small percent of the diagnoses that we made that were for recessive conditions. For most of them, they were like slam dunk kits, you know, like there were two primary ciliary dyskinesia um, diagnoses where the patient had had 15 pneumonias, you know, we're like, okay, this seems like pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, there was a Smith Lonely Opitz, I was saying, which I still, um, intellectual disability, seizures, like, you know, uh, me looking at his driver's license, not driver's license, his state ID photo. Yeah, not driving, not driving. Um, I was like, oh, this, you know, this looks convincing. Um, so there were a few that were like that, which gives me a little bit of hesitation. I would obviously want a little bit more data about him before, you know, there was no dysmorphology exam or anything like that. Um, but most of them were like that. There were, there were a few that were, 
maybe, you know, I was like, oh, this really looks right, but I really would like to see if these variants were, were in trans. But yeah, we, we're try we also have for most of these, for almost the entire 45,000 patients, we also have genotyping array data. And there are tools that allow you to, in combination, kind of phase variants, and we're trying to employ that, but we haven't done that yet in PetMed Biobank. Great. Any other questions? Oh, wait, there's one online. While I was paying attention, to <laughs> online. hold on, hold on. Um, Andrew, can you, oh, I don't think they can unmute. Uh, Andrew Hosley, do you think that stigma within particular groups might be playing a role, or perhaps anticipated stigma or resistance on the part of care providers? That, that's a lot of parts in, in, in one question. I think the, the, the short answer is that I, I don't have a I, I don't have an answer. I think that all of those things are reasonable reasons that people might be avoiding coming to genetics. Um, my gut instinct, though, is that it's a problem with the referrals. I, I, if I had to guess, I would say that black and Hispanic patients and patients of lower socioeconomic status, lower educational background, are, their providers are just not seeing this as something that is important for them to communicate to the patients that this is something they should do. That's what I worry is the, is the problem, rather than something about the providers are equally recommending referral for everybody and then patients are suspicious and so they don't show up. Um, the reason I say that is that when I meet patients in clinic, I don't see any difference. I mean, even the fact that we are, that patients who are, are black or Hispanic are more likely to undergo genetic testing in our clinic. Partially because we're maybe, you know, suggesting it more, but they're more likely to follow through with it as well. Like there are patients who cancel testing. It's a, and so like I, I don't see that for at least the patients who make it through the door. Now you could say the ones who don't come to the clinic are the ones that are, yeah, are skeptical. But I guess, I don't know. I, my, my gut instinct is that it's more to do with um, just preconceived notions about what is important for certain patients and, you know, and, and who should get referred um, that we could fix. But it's a big effort to fix that in terms of, you know, implicit biases. If you look just at like cancer or something like that, do you see the difference between the different ethnicities? If you just see referrals for, I don't know, something that's not like connective tissue disorders where maybe you have the suburban moms pushing their kids or themselves through? Yeah. For cancer, cancer is one of the few indication groups where uh, black and Hispanic patients were more likely to be seen, mm -hmm. uh, slightly more likely to be seen, but significantly so, uh, in the outpatient setting than white patients. And I think that we can... It, I, I really want to attribute that to the fact that we have a very, very robust um, cancer program at Penn um, that does a lot of community outreach, and it, it is like one of the bright spots in our data that we can see that I think when there's a concerted effort to like really reach groups and say cancer genetic testing is important, um, there there are like posters everywhere at Penn. There are like career like not career like fairs like with like you know where people like are really pushing people into it. Um, I think that's probably why we see that. Um, but that was one of the only places. It was that and eye and ear disorders and kidney disease. Um, those are the three that really were where we were doing a good job in terms of black and Hispanic patients being seen in the outpatient setting. So um, be, reading more into it, I think, is reading more into it, you know, without uh, knowing, like, you know, exactly why. But, but that was a, an area where we seem to be doing okay, cancer in particular. And Ben, did you have a question? No, that was just oh. Okay, great. So with that, I think thank us everyone and let's thank Teddy for coming again. Thank you all. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.